So you're the brave ones. <laughs> Textual criticism. <laughs> Yes, uh, I was trying to add it up. I met Matt, it was over 20 years ago when I was teaching at Gordon-Conwell um, Seminary north of Boston. And uh, I went to Gordon-Conwell initially, well, to run the Greek program, but also the carrot they held out was that they wanted uh, me to update their distance ed program. And I've been wanting to move quality education back into the church, I think where it belongs, at least one of the options, uh, for a long time. So I went to Gordon-Conwell thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get them give away their distance ed. And if they want to get graded, if they want credit, one interaction, they can pay for it, but if they want to learn, then Gordon Conwell could uh, teach the world. And I wasn't able to sell him on that vision, and so I said, fool you with this, and Matt and I just started recording classes. And uh, biblical training now is 130 classes and seminars, all the way from new believers to advanced seminary classes. It's all free. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples of classes that will be kind of follow-up on my talk. So that's what biblical training is. That's what I spend the bulk of my time doing uh, these days. Anyway. Now, my wife always makes me put a hat on when I do what I'm going to do to you, but I don't have a hat. So just bear with me. You Christians, you're such a gullible bunch of people. I mean, you carry the Bible around and you get them in leather and gilded gold color on the edges but what makes you think any of it's real? I mean, just think about how you got the Bible, because the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and we don't have any of those original documents. We don't have any copies of the original documents. We don't have copies of the copies of the original documents. We don't have copies of the 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 original documents. There are 138,000 words in the New Testament. There are over 400 thousand errors in the Greek manuscripts. There's three times as many errors as there are words. How can you possibly believe that what you have was what was originally written? Okay, take my hat off now. <laughs> that line of reasoning uh, by Bart Ehrman has sold hundreds of thousands of books, has destroyed the faith of tens of thousands of college students, um, has got him on the New York Times bestseller list multiple times. And it is dangerous because as opposed to a lot of the people that are doing the kinds of things that he does, he's really a good scholar. And he's a uh, very, very good debater. And I'm told he's a pretty nice guy, except that he's an atheist who... Uh, is the head of the Bible department or the New Testament or whatever it's called at N is it NC, Matt, what school? UNC. This, right, I knew it was close. I figured you, you know. This is a real issue. This is a real issue. And he pulls together uh, different arguments and presents them in ways that are very, very powerful. And he's going from one issue to another to another, writing New York Times bestsellers um, for the purpose of, I'm sure he would say, illuminating uh, our children. Uh, we would say for the set purpose of destroying our children. So this is a very important issue. It's a technical issue. And so what I'm going to try to do is to give you a, a feel for what's going on and enough basic answers so that you can at least at least initially counter what he's saying and other people are saying, okay? All right. So his book is called Misquoting, among many, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, it has nothing to do with misquoting Jesus. It's a very clever title. It's about text criticism, uh, but nobody buys books on text criticism. All right. Let me, uh, let me kind of walk through the historical process and cover some terms so that we're clear on these. The autograph is the original document. The autograph is when Paul sat down to write a letter to the Roman church. This is what he would have dictated and his amanuensis would have written out. Uh, it, is, it is the base document. We don't have any autographs. They're all written on papyri, uh, while papyri that are not uh, used extensively can last two to three hundred years. Uh, if you use them extensively, their shelf life, use life is about a hundred years, and so they're all gone. 
So what we have are manuscripts, and that's just our word for copies. And if you notice footnotes in your Bible, uh, sometimes like they'll, they'll come along and they'll, you go down to the footnote, it says AMS has or MSS have. Okay, that's the abbreviation for the manuscript. MS is one, MSS is, is plural. And so the manuscripts are the copies or the copies of the copies or the copies of the copies of the copies. And, and by the way, he's, when he says copies of the copy, it goes on like six, seven times. It's not true. Um, we, uh, the copies that we have are much closer to the original than that. But in case I don't mention that later, I want to say that. What happens then is if you take those different manuscripts and you compare them, there's differences. Okay, this is not a liberally conceived plot to undermine our faith. These are real things. You can, you can have the two best documents we have, uh, Alexandrinus and Vaticanus, and you can compare them, and they're different in about 2,000 places. Uh, by the way, um, isn't this fun? Um, it's a boxer's break, but I wasn't boxing. <laughs> Just let it be clear. I, broke, I was in Australia teaching, and I fell on the beach and snapped my fifth metacarpal. So here's me 14 hours on the flight from Sydney to LAX. It was not. And that was a great big ugly cast. Anyway, that's what this is. So, um, so where those, where we, we look at them and, and this manuscript, John 5, uh, Jesus the Pool of Bethesda or Bethsaida or Bethsatha, however it's spelled, we don't know for sure. And there was a man who'd been lying there for 38 years and Jesus says, you know, what do you want? Go to the other manuscript. Oh, there's a verse four. An angel comes down, stirs up the water, and the first person and gets healed. You go, whoa, one of them has that verse. Uh, the other one, well, Alexandrinus and Sinaiticus don't either have that verse. It's a much later edition. But anyway, you look at him, you go, oh, there's a difference. Okay, we call those differences variants. All right, and they can also be called different readings. So one reading would be not to have verse four. Another reading would be to have verse four. Uh, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples can't kick, kick out the demon, exercise the demon. And Jesus says, this kind can only come up by prayer. Other manuscript says, this kind can only come up by prayer and fasting. Okay, so prayer or prayer and fasting. That's a variant, and those are two different readings. One reading is uh, prayer. Another reading is uh, prayer and fasting. Okay, so these are real issues. You can, well, you can't touch them any longer, uh, but you can, you can look at them in the British Museum and the other places these manuscripts are housed, and you can actually see these differences, okay? Bart Ehrman's and other, uh, he, he's an, he says he's an atheist now, right? I, I'm pretty sure he says he's an atheist. Um, these are, these differences is what, is what they're using to undermining um, our our faith, our, especially our children's faith. Now, here's this, one of my favorite examples. Uh, the Mounces are from Gravel Switch, Kentucky. So just the other side of the uh, mountains from you. And uh, I spent high school and college in Bowling Green. And when I think I was a junior, dad said, let's go find Gravel Switch. He'd never been in Gravel Switch before. Well, my ancestors are hillbillies. Uh, everyone in Gravel switched his name Mounts, as far as I could tell, except one person. That was Mrs. Johnson. She was a foreigner. And it was very strange. It's a very unusual name. If you saw this, the movie Hatfields and McCoys, remember Cotton Top? That's my oldest relative, an insane man who killed a man thinking it was a woman and he got hung for it. Anyway, that's a real story. That's where the Mounts begin. Anyway, it is my cousins, that distant cousins, that think this verse is in the Bible. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any, de any deadly thing, poison, uh, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark 16, 17 to 18. So my question is, where's the venom? Where are your snakes? Don't you believe the Bible? It's in the Bible. Well, it's in the King James. It's kind of important to know why this verse is or isn't in the Bible. Okay, this is one of the extreme examples, but I just wanted to give you an example. All right. 
I know I need to spend a little bit of technical time talking about these differences because what Professor Ehrman will get people to think is that there are simply so many variants that you can't trust a single word in the Bible. Okay, that's, that's the gist of what he's doing and other people are doing. Well, the majority of the differences, we have five, well, the last official count was 5,200 and I think it's 84 we're almost up to 6,000 now. Uh, Dan Wallace, uh, Dallas professor, um, good friend of mine, has a ministry called the Center for Study of New Testament Manuscripts. He's photographing unknown Greek manuscripts buried deep in the vaults of uh, the churches in Istanbul. And they're almost up to 6,000 Greek manuscripts now. But the normal number is 5,280, something like that. That's how many manuscripts we have in Greek. We have another uh, 10,000 in um, Latin, we have another five to 10,000 in other languages. Uh, we have a lot of manuscripts to deal with. And as you compare all the differences, you, what you'll find is that the vast majority of the differences, so the variants, are completely unintentional. And the nice thing about these differences is that they don't, A, you can see them really clearly. Uh, Bart Ehrman talks about how the copyists during the first 200 years were very sloppy. Well, A, they weren't that sloppy. And B, their mistakes are so obvious that it doesn't question anyone's faith. Okay? But there's a, the vast majority of these variants are completely, they're unintentional, and they're insignificant. They're insignificant in terms of what do you and I believe? What do you and I trust? Okay? So, for example... 70% of all variants are spelling differences. Bethesda, Bethesda, I think there's seven ways to spell that name. Uh, Gadarenes, Gergesenes, there's about five ways to spell that town's place. But the net word for John is the one that really gets, it's, this is a very interesting one. I got this really cool pointer. Okay, that's, that's John, Ioannes, and see the two V's in the middle? They're news in Greek. Or it can be spelled with one N. Now, is that significant? Well, maybe to John it is. Um, does it question your faith? No. 70% uh, of the mistake, of the variants that we have in the New Testament are spelling. The most common is what's called a movable new. You know how we say a book, but an apple? Okay, Greek does the same thing. Uh, and that N is, is a new in Greek. And so you would, you would, use the new on the end of a word when the next word begins with a vowel. You would not use a new when the next, when the next word begins with a consonant. All right, so it's exactly the same thing as a to an. Has zero effect on meaning. I mean, zero effect, not even a nuance. There's no difference in meaning. That is the single most common variant in the Greek manuscripts. Sometimes you find variations in names. Is it Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? Okay, it still says the same thing. Um, I, I think the general view is that uh, as the years go by, they switch it more to Christ Jesus because Christ is more of a title. Um, but I'm not sure on that. But anyway, it doesn't affect meaning at all. Another very common one is the use of the article. And in... Hmm, pressing the wrong button. That's the, that's the word the right there. This is Jesus, Iesus. That's the. For some reason that nobody knows, uh, Greek normally precedes proper names with the article. But we will never translate it the Jesus. You'll always translate it Jesus. So whether the ha, the article is there or not, doesn't matter. Uh, it still comes across as Jesus. Thousands and thousands of places you have that kind of variation. Are you, are you getting the drift? There's a lot of differences in the manuscripts. The vast majority have zero effect on the meaning. I'm going to skip that one. So there's a vast majority of the differences in the manuscript are completely unintentional. Hey, by the way, in case I forget to say it, and I do this with a lot of different issues. I'll give you examples tonight at the plenary session. If someone says, I can't trust the Bible, there's so many Greek variants, it's just, the text is so corrupted, just say, could you show me one? And don't tell them you don't know Greek, or I, I heard some clapping, so there are some people that know Greek. But just, just ask them to show you one. 
And that will stop almost every conversation you have. Unless Professor Ehrman happens to come in the back of the room when you're talking. Uh, then you're in really deep trouble and you say, sorry, talk to Dan Wallace. Uh, okay. So there's unintentional. There are intentional changes though. And that doesn't mean the scribes were bad. Almost all of the changes that we can see that are intentional changes are the scribes trying to help the reader. So for example, you can go along and, and the scribe will be writing something. He'll go, oh man, that that can't, that's not how I learned this verse. That can't be what it's saying. And what happens a lot of times is that people would scribble things in the margins, like suggested changes. And then later on, those suggested changes actually get moved into the text by a scribe who goes, yeah, yeah, that marginal reading, that's got to be the right one. And what they're trying to do is to help you understand what the text is saying. I wish they hadn't done it, but they, they do. Another thing that happens is conflation. And, what, and usually this is in the Gospels where they're trying to get the Gospels to agree with each other. That's not a bad thing, right? In fact, the synoptic problem that we're going to talk about tonight, how Matthew, Mark, and Luke can be so similar in certain places and so different in other, um, is, is a real issue. I, I'm going to use my phone to look. I'm not texting anyone, but I, 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 I simply cannot flip pages. I've tried, and I, I, I can't flip pages. In Matthew 17, 21... And what Matt didn't tell you is that I was the New Testament chair of the ESV for 10 years. So thank you for using it. But for the last nine years, I've been on the NIV committee. And I was not hoping that there would be a single NIV in this building. So I'm going to use my phone. Anyway, uh, this is Jesus. So. Because you have so little faith, it's why they couldn't kick out the demon. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 20. In all modern translations, it skips verse 21 and goes to verse 22. Well, gee, you bunch of liberal translators dropping out the Bible. No, if it's wrong to remove from Scripture, it's also wrong to add to Scripture. And these verses where you skip verses were all added hundreds of years later. But what, what happens is, I'm gonna go down to the King James. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. In other words, in the Greek behind the King James, there was an additional sentence that was there. It probably was brought over from the same story in Mark 9, 29, and it was inserted into the Matthew story to make them agree. So that's what conflation is, or you might call it harmonization. Now, when you see that, it's perfectly obvious what's going on. Is it more likely that a scribe would remove a verse that explains something, or is it more likely that a scribe would add something to explain something? It's, it's almost universally understood that scribes tended to add. Uh, you simply don't take away from God's word, but you can add from other places in God's word to make something clear, okay? All right. Uh, clarification, the example I used earlier. Why was the guy lying by the pool for 38 years? Well, I would have real problems theologically if verse 4 actually were in the Bible. Because that's just kind of weird. An angel coming down, stirring up the water, and the first person in is healed. I mean, that would be a unique verse in Scripture. Uh, it seems contrary to how God works. It almost feels like magic. Uh, but that verse doesn't appear for hundreds of years in the Greek manuscripts. We know it was added later, probably to clarify why the guy was lying there for 38 years. So again, very, uh, very clear. Um, well, here's another example of conflation or I guess harmonization. Uh, blessed are the poor or blessed are the poor in spirit? Matthew is blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke says blessed are the poor you can see why a scribe would look at that and go, well, that's weird. Poor people are blessed because they're poor. Blessing by poverty. Well, <laughs> let's have Kenneth Copeland preach that one. <laughs> blessed are the poor. I don't think so. Um, you can see how somebody would say, we need to harmonize these and change Luke to blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, it's clearly not what Luke is saying. Luke has, uh, Luke has a strong emphasis for social outcasts. Uh, and there is a Old Testament concept of of being poor and therefore relying on God. You have to add that into the Old Testament understanding of poverty. And you can see why Luke, 
why Jesus would say it in another situation, I believe, to a group of people, most of them were poor, say, blessed are the poor. And there's a flip-flop going on in, in the world. The world says the rich are blessed. I'm telling you that the poor are blessed. So blessed are the poor. No one questions that. And look, we all know that's what Jesus said on the sermon on the, in the, in, in, that's recorded in Luke 6. Uh, Matthew 5 was a different one. Anyway, there are intentional changes, is all I'm trying to say. Uh, Not because the scribes are bad people, but because they're trying to help us understand. Let me kind of categorize, that's one way to categorize these variants, uh, intentional or unintentional. Let me give you a slightly different way to categorize them. And there's there's four four different categories. Uh, Is the variant meaningful but not viable? What that means is there is a change in meaning, but yet the variation... Uh, there's no way to support it. There's no question that these are, readings are not original. I'll give you an example. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul says, we were like young children. Then um, there's a footnote there in the NIV. Uh, I'm sure there's in the ESV too. Uh, we were like young children among you. And the footnote says, we're gentle. In other words, we were gentle among you. Well, if you look at the Greek, I get my cool pointer out here. Nepioi. Napioi is young children, epioi is gentle. And if you know Greek, one has the new at the beginning, the other one doesn't have a new at the beginning. It'd be really easy to make that mistake, wouldn't it be, when you're writing it out? Especially since the preceding word ends in a new. And so instead of going, mm, mm, you could get that second mm, dropped out. Um, that's a meaningful change. And It is somewhat viable. Both of these readings are possible, okay? But there is a reading in another translation that says, I got to quit pointing. Hippioi, say, nepioi, apioi, hippioi. And you can see the Greek, it's only one letter, two letters difference. Well, um, hippioi means horses, okay? We were like horses among you. That's what I'm saying. And these kind of unintentional mistakes, they're so obvious. It's not viable. But when you count up how many variants there are in the New Testament, this counts as one. Now, it's not viable. I mean, it's, no, nobody thinks that's what Paul wrote. But it, it is part of the numbering process. Okay, what about ones that are, they don't mean anything, and we just, we obviously know they're not viable. We know that this can't be what was originally written. Um, John 1.30, um, Epistle Moon, after me, Erechtei comes a man, okay? Aner. There's an 8th century codex that says, after me comes a heir, heir. <laughs> so in this manuscript, John says, after me comes heir. Again, that's not viable. Everyone knows that that's not what John wrote, but it is part of the numbering. See, what I'm, what I'm getting at is uh, the number is about 400,000 variants in the New Testament. But 99% of them are meaningless. Either they're silly and we know that they're, they're not authentic or they have no real uh, effect on our meaning. So that's why I need to show these to you so you can be confident with that. Uh, not meaningful, not viable. Uh, nobody looks at those. But Dan Wallace, we have a class. Dan Wallace is the premier text critic today. He's a professor at Dallas. He's the one that has the Center for Study of New Testament Manuscripts. And by the way, it's a nonprofit. It's a great nonprofit to support. It costs him about $40,000 per session. But he's the only person that's being allowed into these very, very old libraries in Istanbul photographing Greek manuscripts that no one has ever seen. And Dan is absolutely convinced that at the end of his life, there will be no questions left as to what the original Greek text is. And he's spending the rest of his life to do this. He's written the standard second year Greek grammar. Uh, His book on textual criticism is coming out. He finally finished it only 10 years late for Zondervan. And uh, Dan's very, uh, in his own words, anal. And uh, he's very meticulous and very, very, very careful. And uh, that's why it takes him a long time to finish a book. But anyway, his ministry is, he's, they're the ones that we now have almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts. He's the only one finding these manuscripts. 
And he, and so we have a class of his on biblical training, a three-hour seminar and a full 20-hour class. And in that class, he talks about, how do you say John loves Mary in Greek? And he goes through a very, you would probably enjoy it, but it was, um, there's over a thousand ways in Greek to say John loves Mary with no difference in meaning. That's the important point. Well, if you can say John loves Mary a thousand different ways with no difference in meaning, then all of a sudden, that the fact that there's 400,000 variants, it's not that big of a deal. That's where we're trying to get to. But this is the category that um, keeps people like Dan up at night. There are variants that they do change the meaning. And both or all three options can be supported. They all have, there's good arguments that any of these could be the original. Now, Dan estimates that only 25% of 1%, I guess I should say, a quarter of a percent of all the variants fit this category. None of them are theologically significant. None of them are going to affect what you believe or how you behave. But there are about 20, about 25, what, what, what's the word I'm trying to think of? A quarter of 1% of all the variants fall into this category. Well, here's an example. I'll give you a couple examples. Romans 8, 2, for the law, and these are Dan's examples, for the law of the spirit of life, Paul says in Christ Jesus, has set you, okay, and the, the Greek word is the se, S-E, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Other Greek manuscripts has, has set me, mu epsilon, see, S-E-M-E. Oh, it's really hard. There's a lot of good manuscripts have se, a lot of good manuscripts have me. Other Greek manuscripts have humas, which is you. And that obviously is a scribe saying, I don't know whether Paul said you or me, so I'm gonna say us. Okay, so we, we know that the us isn't original. We don't really know whether it's you or me. All right, now, does that affect anyone's faith in Jesus Christ and the resurrection? Okay, because <laughs> if it does, there's a whole other topic we need to talk about. Uh, Philippians 1.14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The word? <laughs> what, in a first century context, what would the word mean? I have no idea. Well, a translation, a lot of trans, uh, manuscripts came along and said the word of God. Other manuscripts added word of the Lord. It's interesting. The NIV says the gospel there, which kind of gets around the problem altogether. I don't know what the uh, ESV does there. Well, we're really sure that of God or of the Lord was added later, but we can't be confidently sure, completely sure. So there are some variants that are meaningful and are viable in the sense you can argue that that's what was originally written. It's these kinds of things. Me, me and you and us gets mixed up all the time in the manuscripts. Okay, you can imagine why. Again, no theological issues or matters of faith. Okay, so that's the problem. Where are we? In? I, I can't wait to get a new Apple Watch because it's on all the time. Have you seen that? So I'm always tapping this thing to see what time it is. Okay. Any questions up to this point? I'm going to now move into how text critics make their decisions. But is, is it what the nature of the variance clear? Okay. Textual criticism, um, I, I tell my students that either you're a textual critic or you have a life. <laughs> you, you, it's really hard to have both. Uh, Dan would consider himself, by his own words, quite anal, and, uh, but he does have a bit of a life, still teaches at Dallas. Uh, Gordon Fee uh, was a phenomenal text critic. When he went off the end, he had a, had a heart attack, and he has Parkinson's now. And when went off the NIV committee, it was a real loss because he was a world-class text critic. And thankfully, Dan came on the NIV committee, so we have a good text critic now. Uh, Gordon was a world-class 
um, text critic. He's also a raging Pentecostal and was responsible for all the capital spirits in the NIV, I like to tell people, because his goal in life was to capitalize Penuma as much as he possibly could. Anyway, apart from those two people, the text critics do nothing but text criticism because it's so complicated. So, um, anyway, there's two things that text critics look at. The first of all, they look at external things. When they have two manuscripts that are different, um, they want to know, well, where did it come from? Did it come from the area of Alexandria? Did it come from the, uh, the western side of, of the world? Did it come from, these are called different text types. Did it come from the Caesarean area? They, we, we know that different areas of the world had different biases towards how you copy. In Alexandria, it was very clear that their intention was to not add or change the Greek text at all. But you get into other areas, especially where there's been a lot of missionary work, you, you get a lot of, like, uh, the, the text of Acts and the Caesarean text is 10% longer than the Alexandrian. Why? Because they're trying to help people who know nothing about Christ understand what Luke wrote in Acts. And you, you help people by adding. And so there are different tr uh, ways in which different areas of the world treated the text. Uh, if, it's an, if it's from Alexandria, it's, it's from that area of the world, northern Egypt, um, it's, they're given a lot more weight than if they're from the other area. So they look at, okay, what family of languages is this from, a text. They want to know how old it is. Now, the Greek text behind the King James is based primarily on three manuscripts that come from the 1100s. So that means there's been a thousand years for things to be changed. Well, that's fine. That's what we had. That's what Erasmus had. And so he took those. There were, there, were, there were two of everything but Revelation, and he would compare them and make a choice. He had one manuscript of Revelation that included everything but the last six verses. So he copied that, and then he made up the last six verses in Greek and didn't do a very good job. The, all kinds of mistakes. And, but he was a good scholar. And that became uh, the basis, simplified here, that became the basis of the King James. Okay, well, that's all we had. Well, about 150 years ago, we realized that in the sands of Egypt, papyri don't disintegrate as quickly. And we started, archaeologists started digging up much, much older manuscripts. Sinaiticus is 4th century. Vaticanus is 4th to 5th century. This is like six, 700 years earlier than the Greek text behind the King James, six or 700 less years for changes to be introduced. And so when we look at a manuscript that was written in the fourth century versus a manuscript that was written in the 11th century, which one are you gonna trust? You're gonna default to the fourth century one, okay? So they look at external things like that. And then they look at internal things. And the main internal thing they look at is what's called the harder reading. I don't really know, it, it, the, the name sounds backwards to me. Well, what they ask is, which reading would most likely give rise to the other reading? So, this kind only cometh out by prayer and fasting or by prayer? Which one would have given rise to the other? Is it more likely that and fasting would have been removed by someone who doesn't like asceticism, I guess? Or is it more likely that it would be added? Well, that makes this type cometh out, cometh, <laughs> comes out only by prayer, the harder reading, because it would give rise to the other reading, prayer and fasting. See how that works? Now, this is a judgment call, and this is a very simplified way of looking at it, but those are the kinds of things that text, there's many, many other things they look at, but does that make sense? That's kind of what they're thinking about. Okay. Well, here's, here's what text critics have found. And again, I'm going to pick on Professor Ehrman because in his book, Misquoting Jesus, he deals with these first two passages in detail. And while he doesn't say it, it gives the impression that these kinds of problems are everywhere in the Bible. And again, when I say Bible, I mean the Greek New Testament Bible. Uh, text criticism in uh, the Old Testament is a totally different uh, ball of wax. Um, and so this is the impression, if we have these two 
passages, both I think like 12 verses each, and we've had them in our Bibles forever, and they're obviously not original. How can you trust any of it? Because that's the, that's the way the argument goes. Well, um, this is the passage of the woman caught in adultery, and this is the longer ending of Mark with the venom and the snakes. These are the only two large passages that are that uh, don't belong in the Bible. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that John never wrote the story of the woman caught in adultery and Mark never wrote the longer ending. There's zero, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some information in a second. There's zero question about it. But it's always been in the King James. And so when you, you, you get to a modern translation, what do you do with these passages? I, I suggested a giant footnote because all the other editions that are in the King James get footnoted out of respect to the King James in all the other modern translations, except maybe the NLT. Um, and I suggested footnoting these, and um, I think it was a, a 1 to 14 vote. Uh, they said to be the longest footnote in the world's history, and the typesetters will kill us if we want this big of a footnote. Anyway, so this is why your Bibles do everything they can to say, this doesn't belong. There'll be a line above it and below it. Uh, it'll be set in, a, this is what the NIV does, line above and below it, set in a smaller typeface, italicized with an explanation as to why it's different. And the ESV did something very, very close to that. One of the problems is that the electronic people um, are in trouble because uh, as far as the NIV is concerned, we control all the headings and all the typography because we use like spacing as, as a way to convey meaning. And so uh, in my particular uh, electronic Bible, it doesn't do that with these verses and uh, where the committee is, is uh, taking action on that. Let me give you, without boring you to death, let me just give you some statistics. John 8 um, is missing, missing from all early Greek manuscripts for hundreds of years. It doesn't occur in the old Syriac translation of John. No church father comments on it, which is a very significant thing, until the 12th century. The first time we see it in any Greek manuscript is the 5th century. It's added in various places um, in John, and even one manuscript puts it in Luke. That's a pretty good indication that the people don't know where it belongs. It's often added in the manuscripts with a little notation, not authentic, because people were familiar with it, the scribes were including it. If you read chapter seven to chapter eight, it obviously interrupts because chapter seven and eight are on the same festival of lights the, in, in, in Jerusalem. And right in the middle is something that, that completely disrupts the flow of what John is writing. Those are the kinds of things we look at and go, there is no question that John never wrote the pericope, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Now, for some reason that I don't know, People are very, commentators are very quick to say, but we believe that it actually happened. John just didn't write it. And that's my, and that's, that's my response is like, well, why would you be sure it happened? It's a unique experience. Well, that's the kind of thing Jesus would do. Well, really? Uh, find me another story where Jesus behaves that way. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the Mark 16 uh, is not in the earlier Greek manuscripts. Uh, it, annotations in the earliest manuscripts where it appears it's marked as not being authentic. The church fathers never talk about it. Uh, Eusebius in the fourth century says that accurate copies of Mark end at verse eight. Um, Jerome, who did the Latin Vulgate, said uh, it's not authentic. So we get all these. This is the kind of thing that text critics look at. So, and one of the charges that's made is that translators have hidden these things? And the answer is, read your footnotes. Translators have been very good at saying, this doesn't belong. But again, because of the force of the King James, and because we're used to hearing verse 4, and angels stirring up the water, at least if you've been in the church as long as I have, you're used to that. Um, it's, it's totally out of deference to the King James tradition that the, the, the 17, quote, added verses, or the 17 missing verses, um, um, and then these two are the big passages. They're all in the footnotes, or they're all marked. So they're not missing. 
I think the number one question I have to answer when I speak is why do you leave 17 verses out of the Bible? And my answer is, why did people add 17 verses to the Bible? Uh, but anyway, there's, we have not been hiding anything. It's, they're clearly indicated. All I have to do is look at the footnotes. I, I've asked that question on multiple times. And uh, for the ESV, the answer is that it was very important to the publisher that the ESV be seen as in the lineage of Tyndale and the King James. And so you don't want to leave stuff out, but you, you mark it. But you, so there, there was a philosophical approach in the ESV uh, to try to be in that, in that, tree, that uh, line of translation. Um, I don't know why the NIV keeps them in. Um, there's no question that these 17 verses to pick on them don't belong. They're not original. Um, and what people don't understand about the NIV is that, and we, we get comments like, um, oh, I'm never going to read the NIV because the same publisher publishes the Satanic Bible. Well, a little bit of publicity here. Uh, International Bible Society, not called Biblica, owns the NIV. Okay, they, they hold the copyright. The Committee on Bible Translation is a totally autonomous group, and we can do anything we want to do with the text. I used to say we can make God a woman, but we're not going to, <laughs> and people still thought the NIV wanted to make God a woman. So I stopped using that as an illustration, although I did with you. We, we are a completely autonomous group, and that's why we're so careful at who we let into the group. Uh, we control the text. Zondervan prints the text in the U.S. and in a few other places. Hodder and Stoughton does it in Europe. Zonovan is owned by HarperCollins Christian, that's owned by HarperCollins, that's owned by News Corp, that's run by Murdoch. Okay, so, and by the way, it's a great, it's a great arrangement for Zonovan. Uh, Harp, being bought by Harper was a godsend. It was an answer to prayer, actually. Uh, Zonovan was in real serious trouble. And they, uh, they've given Zonovan the stability to really become the premier Christian publisher there is. And so um, it's important you understand those differences. So I didn't know why I got... Oh, so we don't feel any pressure from the publisher. Not like ESV did. Um, so I don't know why we keep him in. Probably, you know, in 20 years when the King James generation is gone, then I think maybe you'll start seeing those verses go away, but probably not before. Yeah. 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 It's been it's been a wonderful arrangement for Zonovan as long as Zonovan makes their profit margin. Uh, Harper is fine with them. Harper Collins has Harper One. The Satanic Bible is published by Harper One, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so we have no connection with it at all. Uh, I've been told that Zonovan has gone directly to Harper saying you have got to get rid of that book and Harper One won't. So, but anyway, it's a good arrangement. So anyway, no, no political or publishing pressure on us. But I, my guess is as we get older, um, gen next generation dies off, then we will, uh, I don't know. All right, so only two big passages have been brought into question. There's about a dozen passages that involve one to two verses that are, uh, that are questionable. And this is the one that causes most of the trouble. Uh, you'll often see, the, people go after the NIV because it's the top dog from, in the publishing world. But it's true of all modern translations. So the CSB, uh, the NASB, uh, the NRSV, which is not particularly cons a conservative group of people, um, the NLT, all these different Bibles, they're all the same. They just put people will pick on the NIV. This is uh, 1 John 5, 7b to 8a. And so what John wrote was this, for there are three that bear record, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay, that, that's what John wrote. 
If you read in the King James, what you have is a very clear affirmation of the Trinity. Uh, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And so when you hear people accusing the NIV or any modern translation of having a theological agenda, this is the verse they're thinking about. Uh, Now, first of all, uh, our doctrine of the Trinity doesn't hinge on one verse. Um, And I would never try to prove the Trinity um, based on this verse. But here's how frustrating the discussion gets, because people will, this is a King James only kind of discussion, and it's, they're difficult discussions. There's only four manuscripts, four Greek manuscripts that have that edition, and they're not till after uh, Erasmus's text. So they're, I don't know, 1400, 1500. Uh, clearly not originally written, not quoted by the early church fathers. Um, the first quote you have is in a Latin document. And the only reason that verse got into the Vulgate is that Jerome got challenged and he had to put it in. And the story is for Erasmus, he wasn't going to include that unless you, somebody could produce a Greek text. Apparently some priest went and made it up, showed it to him, and, Jerome, and uh, Erasmus said, well, I got to include it, I guess. And so he sticks it in his Greek text, gets into the King James. Uh, we know it doesn't belong. We know that John never, ever, ever wrote that. The, the external evidence is really clear. Uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Right? It's not in any of the modern translations except in the footnotes. Jesus never said it. It comes up hundreds of years later. See, what you can say is you can look at all the early manuscripts and the verse isn't there, the verse isn't there, the verse is, the verse is there. Okay, the, the only possible conclusion is that it was added hundreds of years later. Uh, John 5, 4, the angel coming down. Um, another passage. The rest of the variants are just one and two words. Again, the, the main thing I'm trying to convey is that when you see this number, 400,000 variants in the Greek manuscripts, um, they're very minor and they don't affect hardly any meaning at all. They certainly don't affect any theology, okay? Um, Matthew 5, 22, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Some Greek manuscripts say anyone who is angry without cause. Now, would you have added without cause to explain it, or would you have taken it out because you just wanted to be angry? (laughs) Well, it's obviously been added, all right? Um, uh, Prayer or prayer and fasting. Now, this is an interesting one, and uh, this is where one that I think the NIV needs to uh, really relook at their decision. This is the, the leper who comes to Jesus. And it says, Jesus was, and the NIV says, indignant. Everyone else says, Jesus had compassion. Now, why on earth would Jesus look at a leper and be indignant? Well, the argument, I wasn't on the committee when this decision was made, but I'm sure the argument was, you can't go from compassion to indignant. You can only go from indignant to compassion. You can see why a scribe would see indignant and go, there's no way that Jesus was indignant. It has to be compassion. Now, if Jesus were indignant, he's not being indignant at the leper. I could see Jesus being really mad that we've messed up his good world And part of the consequence of our sin is disease. And I could see Jesus being indignant when he looks not at the man, but thinks, I made this place good and you messed it up. But the the Greek, the textual evidence is way in favor of compassion. And we just don't know why some manuscripts wrote indignant. Again, those are the kinds of discussions that we get involved in. Okay, now I've been talking a lot about the 400,000. This is where it it all comes to a head. Let's say you have a verse and you have four different options. You have Ioannes with two news, the two V's in the middle. And there are 10,000 manuscripts that have John's name with two. 
You have other manuscripts that have it with one N, Ioannes. Let's say there's a thousand, I'm making these numbers up, but let's say they have a thousand. One manuscript has Petros, the name for Peter, and no, let's say no, there's 10 manuscripts that have Petros, and there's one manuscript that has nothing. The name's just omitted. How many variants do you have? Well, the Bart Ehrman people will say you have 1,111 variants. In other words, they, they times the, the reading by the number of manuscripts and it increases the number. And by the way, if you do that, it's actually way more than 400,000. It's Dan's kind of puzzled why you're such a low number because it'd be in the millions actually because we have so many Greek manuscripts. Uh, some evangelical, very conservative writers would call it one. And by that count, there's about 2,000. That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? But text critics would count that as four. There are four variant readings in this place. And it doesn't matter that one of the variant readings was copied 10,000 times, another was copied 1,000 times, and so forth and so on. The, the, the real number is four and I, I was trying to get a hold of Dan this morning to confirm this, but that's the number that goes up to 400,000. All right. Again, the, but even the problem, of, the problem with saying that is it gives the impression, since there's 138,000 or so words in the New Testament, it makes it look like every word is suspect, and that's not the case. There's, there's many, 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 many words that ha- there are no variant readings. But there are many that do have variant readings. Again, most of them insignificant, and most of them, it's obvious how it's been changed. It seems like reasons for how it's been sort of not measure validity is not So it seems somewhat unfair to just have a thousand, if one manuscript that has a variation, that's not a very likely variation. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the, if, the advantage that the majority text has, which is Textus Receptus is a, a branch of the majority text, is what's behind the King James. Uh, the advantage they have is on any major reading, there's at least 500 manuscripts with both variations. In other words, it's pretty, it's much easier. It's not easy, but it's easier in the majority text stream of manuscripts to figure out where are the variations and which which ones are valid and which ones do we really need to look at because there's so many majority text manuscripts. And so when Hodge and Farstad at Fuller, uh, (laughs) um, not Fuller, the exact opposite, Dallas, uh, did uh, their comp- <laughs> don't tell Dr. Litvin I said that, please. Um, when they did their majority text, Greek text, it was a lot easier because you have so many copies of those manuscripts that you can, you can make intelligent decisions. Dan actually spends an entire hour, an entire lecture on how do you count variants on, his, on the class on biblical training. That's how complicated this is. But... Um, so when you hear someone say there's, you know, there's millions of variations, they're in, they're in the 1,111 camp, and that's just not fair. It's disingenuous. You can call it what you like. It's not fair. Because so let's say, um, oh, I know, I know one. There's, uh, what's the mark of the beast? 666. And the only way, as I recall, the only way to get to 666 is to translate Nero's name into another language and misspell it. Now, if it's 616, it spells Nero Caesar in Latin. So why isn't it 616? Well, there is a manuscript that Dan found dated 12th, 13th century that is just a bizarre manuscript. It's got changes all over the place, except for Revelation. For it's, it's one of the best Greek manuscripts of Revelation we have, and it has 616. See, this, this is how complicated the world of text criticism comes. 
Now, he's not going to get, because that is such an odd manuscript, you, by default, you don't treat it with much respect, except in Revelation. And now they have a number that actually does line up with Nero. Of course, the argument is the original was 6-6. Six, six. It didn't match Nero, and someone changed it to Nero's number. This is, this is, this is the kinds of issues they have to deal with. We're almost done here. Um, if you compare, and I, again, I meant to check this. I think it's the two main documents are Alexandrinus and, uh, and uh, Vaticanus. If you compare them, there's about 2,000 places they're different. Places they're different. I, and, and for me, that's the, that's the important number. Because if, 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 Sin, if these two manuscripts, Sinaiticus, I guess they're both in the British Library now, uh, Sin, I think, Anyway, uh, Sinaiticus is. Uh, if you compare Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and they both have the same Greek, those two manuscripts together are so good, they're fourth century, they're going to beat almost anybody out. Very rarely do we, if, if Sinaiticus and Vaticanus agree, do we do something different. That's how good these manuscripts are. But if you compare them, there's about 2,000 places they're different. That's a good number. Hundred thirty-eight thousand. That's how many. Hundred thirty-eight thousand. I forget the number. It's it's in BBG. If you want to look it up, whoever has it. Um, Two hundred sixty-two, something like that. Words. Um, in terms, of, if you look at Greek texts today, which are the variants that are interesting enough to mention? The UBS text has fourteen hundred and eight variants listed. Now this is um, the the two. Bible societies got together and agreed on the same text, which is nice, uh, but they have different footnotes. And the United Bible Society's text tends to list less variants, but give more evidence for who, which manuscripts support what reading. They, they have 1,408 readings. The Nestle Lot text, which lists a whole, it lists 30,000 variations. And they wanted to give more of a full scope of where the issues are. If you go to the uh, NIV, the 2011, there's 282 that are footnoted. And in the ESV, there's 460. So you look at the 282, 460, what that means is that there's, let's say there's 500 places where the differences in the Greek manuscripts are sufficient that the translators thought, I need to point this out. Okay, so hopefully these numbers are helping. We're almost done here and you can talk. And even if you want to pick up the number 400,000, it's not every word. The real question is, what is the significance of the variation? If there's a new on the end of the word or not, it doesn't affect meaning. So what? That's not significant. And uh, one of Dan's ongoing critiques of Professor Ehrman's writings is that he doesn't raise the issue of significance. He only raises the, the issue of the numbers and doesn't say, but of course, this is meaningless. Uh, in the second edition of uh, Misquoting Jesus, um, in, in the, uh, I think it's in the appendix, he actually states, none of these variations affect anything we believe. He said it. So that's kind of a big deal. I need to get a hold of the second edition. <laughs> so this is normally... Uh, Dan said, I think it was 2013, there's 5,842 manuscripts. Uh, it's, it's up to almost 6,000 now without any autographs. 99% of the texts were sure. There's just, there's no question. No serious text critic is going to raise an issue on these, on 99% of the texts. All right. And in that remaining 1%, the you versus me, Gadarenes versus Gergesenes, this kind of stuff, there's zero theological implications. These variations don't affect anything that we believe. Even if there were strong textual evidence for the Trinity passage in 1 John, you could have it or not have it. It's irrelevant because we can argue for the divinity of Christ and, the, and, and that's how you do it. You, you start with God, the Father is, is, is God. And then you go to argue that Jesus is God. So you have a duality 
And at that point, it's easy to move to the Trinity because, you know, there's things like in the name, singular of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's, there's a, there are a lot of hints in the, well, there's some hints in the Bible that, that there's a Trinity. Uh, it's not going to be dependent upon one verse, even if that verse had any real support for being authentic. Okay, um, what's next? If you go to biblical training, we have three different categories of classes. Foundations is what most people are interested in. And if you go to the foundations, there's a class that I did called Why I Trust My Bible. And it's about a 10-hour class. I'm going to cover some of it tonight. Uh, but a lot of what I've been saying today is in one of the lectures in that class. Uh, this is a class that has been simplified and you shouldn't have any, nobody should have any trouble processing it. If you want to go deeper, you go to what's called the academy and there's a class in there, it's plural, why we trust our Bible. And this is actually the class that I simplified. And what I did is I went out and I got the world's best people on these topics. So Daryl Bach from Dallas talks about the historical Jesus. Craig Blomberg from Trinity, uh, Denver Seminary talks about the historical reliability of the documents. Uh, Michael Kruger, the president of RTS in Charlotte, uh, talks about canon. And Dan Wallace talks about um, text criticism. And their lectures are all about three hours apiece. And then if you really want to get into text criticism, uh, there's something called the Institute, which is seminary. And we have a full, in fact, I'm working on outlines. I was this morning uh, working on the outlines for these classes. And it's full 20 hour on text criticism. And like I say, his book is due out of the publisher pretty soon. So if you want to follow these, this discussion up, uh, those are the places that I would go to. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. A lot of ground, a lot of technical stuff. My main goal was not to teach text criticism, but to show the kinds of variations that we have in the manuscripts and why none of them have any effect on the trustworthiness of the Bible. So comments or questions? Right. Right. Wallace, Dan Wallace, yeah. So there's a, there's a link at the top called Classes, and when it drops down, you'll see, I think we call Level 1, Level 2, Level 3, Foundations Academy Institute, and you can, you can go there. Or there's a search bar. You can just type in textual criticism and get Dan's class. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Old Testament. You mean that language is all chicken scratch and the, the chickens put their feet in ink and walked around on the page and supposedly they can read, read it? You mean that Old Testament? <laughs> Hebrew wasn't my uh, forte. Uh, let me see. I, mean, I can summarize this. Uh, text criticism is totally different in the Old Testament. The Hebrew text that we have is called the Masoretic text. Uh, Hebrew is written without vowels. It was pronounced with vowels, but it was written without vowels. And by, you get to about the 8th century AD, the master said, we have to develop a vowel pointing system, it's called, because people are forgetting how to read and to speak the language. And so instead of altering the consonants, which is all they had, they do the dots and dashes above and below to indicate what the vowels were. But it's the only, th it's the only manuscripts that we had. And the uh, Masoretes and the later Jewish scribes were so reverential and so careful. Uh, for example, they, they saw no need to harmonize text. And that's why you have the problem with Chronicles. Sometimes the numbers don't line up. Uh, they actually knew the middle letter of every book. And when they were done making a manuscript for a, a book, they would count from the front and the back. And if they didn't line up on the right letter, they would throw the manuscript away and start over again. So there's all kinds of incentives to be incredibly careful. This is why the Dead Sea Scrolls were so important. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, what we had are Greek man, uh, Hebrew manuscripts that were eight, 900 years earlier. And what everyone was curious was, are they the same or are they different? If, if the Dead Sea Scrolls from 200 BC are the same as the Masoretic text from 800 AD, then we know that the Jews did a really good job copying their manuscripts. If they're different, then we have a whole other set of problems. And what we found is that the Jews were incredibly careful. 
that there are some differences, but very little um, of significance. Um, and so that's why it's not a big debate on the Jewish scriptures because of that particular fact. So, yes, sir. Yeah, I would, um, all modern translations are based off the same critical Greek text. Uh, the Bible societies, Bruce Metzger, Alant, uh, have done just a, a really, really good job of doing the text critical work and coming up with what they think is the best Greek text and then giving the evidence for it and giving major variations. So we all work from the same Greek text. Every, every modern translation, except for the New King James, which isn't a modern translation, it's just updating the English. Um, and so we're all working from the same text. And what I would say is when, it, when there's a footnote that says other manuscripts say or some, something like that, understand, <laughs> I joke that it's, it's easier to get the text of the Bible changed than it is to get a footnote. I don't know why. Uh, the ESV especially was just absolutely resistant against footnotes. And we were in Romans 5, and either it's uh, death spread to all people, and the F whole can either mean because all people sinned or in whom all people sin. It's the core verse for federalism. Uh, are you, we're all born with origin, the effects of original sin, but are we born guilty of original sin? And that's federalism. And the federalists would like it to say in whom, meaning in Adam we sinned. And we voted on it, and the committee, I think, was unanimous that it was because. And I looked across at a couple of the translators that I knew were Federalists, and I said, you want a footnote? And they said, no. I went, this is your main verse, and don't you want something in the footnote? He goes, no, we think that here it means because. And it was like, oh, that was really interesting. Now, sometimes you can't do that, the Net Bible was translated by dispensationalists at Dallas. And there are times you have to make a decision as to whether the Gentiles are the church. I mean, the, the, the church is Israel or not. And, um, but for the most part, I've been really pleased with how translators have not pushed their theological agenda. Not even in the footnotes. <laughs> and so when you see a footnote, somebody had to really make a strong argument. Both ES, I can only speak from the ESV, and the NIV, because the NIV is just as resistant against footnotes. They say, just do your best argument. We're going to vote on it, and we're going to move on. So if there's a footnote, pay attention to it, and don't base your sermon or your Sunday school lesson or your theology on it, because if it does a long way to say it's really hard to get a, unless it's a net Bible, it's really hard to get a footnote in, and there had to be something really significant to get it in there. Just don't. Don't base anything on it. Um, you have the Jehovah's Witnesses um, take texts and mm -hmm. change words and right. things like that. Do they have any textual scholars? Or yeah. just... It's one of those questions I've always been curious about. It's, no one I know developed that Greek text. Um, no one I know did the translation. No one I know would say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, small g. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a total violation of Greek grammar. And Dan Wallace goes on for pages on his grammar on that. So I, I, it's really hard. for my, my guess is it's a majority text that's been tweaked for their theology, but I don't know. I don't know the people involved. And then I say, by the way, if you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness and they want to say that Jesus was a created being, a God, and they're in John 1.1, 1, 1, Take them to 118. They didn't change 118. And 118 is just as clearly an affirmation of the divinity of Christ. I don't know how they missed it. But there you have Jesus, who is God, who is beside the Father. 
distinct from the Father. You, you have a duality there. Anyway. One last Okay, no, she... Oh. <laughs> the question is how to translate out of foy, brothers or brothers and sisters. Um, that's actually going to come up. We're talking about translation tomorrow, aren't we? Yeah, I have a whole section on this. Are you going to be here tomorrow? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no, it will be recorded. Yeah. Okay. Well, it wouldn't matter. I'm not going to change my opinion. We actually tried brothers and sisters in the ESV and it lost by a very narrow po uh, point. Um, the, there is no theological agenda. There is no such thing as an inclusive Bible. There's no such thing as a gender inclusive Bible, a uh, no, gender neutral Bible. They don't exist. And people say, you know, that the NIV is and others. The, the question is, what does brothers mean? What does the word he mean? And what does the word man mean? And this is totally an issue of English grammar, nothing else. And in, um, down here, uh, my guess is that when you all hear man and he, you instinctively make it generic. Okay, you're in the South. Doesn't happen anywhere else. Doesn't happen in the North now. It doesn't happen in India. Second largest English-speaking block in the world. Uh, English, as we've got all, Zonovan spent a quarter of a billion dollars to find the answer to that question. And they let a secular company do the research. And as much as grammarians hate it, they is becoming the pronoun that's unmarked. A, a quick story. So my daughter is eight, nine years old. We homeschool, pretty protective, very little TV, um, no outside influence. Um, and my wife thinks that the only people that should take an offering are men in suits. Okay, that's, that's kind of her background. So zero pressure. And I walked into her bedroom once and she had Xeroxed a, a verse out of the Bible and had crossed out he, put she, and thumbtacked it to the board. Robin! <laughs> I said, do you know anything about this, Robin? She goes, no, no. Kirsten! <laughs> and I complimented her on her desire to, to memorize. That's why I was up on the board, was to memorize it. And I said, uh, I'm curious why you crossed out he. She said, well, the verse doesn't just apply to Tyler. My big brother does it, and it applies to me as well. Here was an eight-year-old kid with no outside influence that read he is male, and not generically. Uh, people don't like this. A lot of people don't like it, but English is changing so radically and so quickly now that the majority of people um, hear he and man as male only. So it's the question of what does the word adafoi mean? The word adafoi in most uses of the Bible refers to members of the same faith community. How do you say that? You say brothers and sisters. That's the only way to say it. And we could say, well, we should say man and we should say he and people should understand it generically. But you, you don't tell language what to do. Language tells you what to do. And uh, language is changing. It'd be nice. It's a whole lot easier to translate what the CSB and the ESV did where they can say, blessed is the one, which is totally generic. Blessed is the one who walks down in the council of the ungodly for blank. How do you refer back to the one? And ESV and CSB use he. Uh, the NRSV, I think, did a very poor job. They use plurals and second persons, and it's, it's just hard to read. Uh, when, you're, when you're encouraging people with the Bible, when you switch into plural, it loses force. Um, singulars are way more impactful than plurals are. Um, and the fun, the, here's the, here's the, and I'll close on this. Here's the thing on these pronouns. I listen to my ESV buddies speak, and they use they, referring to a singular antecedent. But see, speech is ahead of the written word. And so what we hear now, very naturally, is still a little abrasive in print. The one who has ears to hear, let 
them. See, because once you go with they, you have to go with them. And in English, the one who has ears to hear, let them, them has to refer to ears. By normal, yeah, that's, and that's the problem. It, it, won't in, it won't in 20 years. And there is, up until a couple of years ago, there was no reflexive themselves. It's now in the dictionaries. So in 20 years, this will not be an issue. But that's the problem in the translation world. We're right in the middle of this. And speech has gone far ahead of the written word, but the written word is still lagging behind in the evolution of the language. But it'll, it'll catch up eventually. And all the Bibles will be they and them. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. The when my my daughter's a PhD student in art history, and when she she loves to speak at symposiums, and her bio she has to she has to refer to herself as they. They is. She will not be allowed in the symposium if she doesn't. She, they is a PhD student at the University of Delaware in art history. They is from Washington State. And this is part of the potential repercussions of using they that we get attached to the social movement. But you need to know, I don't know a single programmer with, an, with a gender agenda. Not a single one. Translator, yeah, what did I say? Program, okay, uh, translator. Um, there just is no political agenda on the NIV, certainly not on the ESV. I know the guys on the CSB, most of the ones on the NLT, there is no political agenda. There's no gender confusion agenda. This is just where language is going. We get accused of it all the time. It's simply not true. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.